So uh, I'm really happy uh, to welcome Angie Byron, who is uh, uh, with Acquia now and has been uh, helping to shepherd Drupal for several years and uh, um, is one of the core maintainers of Drupal and uh, knows uh, more about Drupal than certainly I do. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know uh, about that. Most folks in the uh, on the planet, and uh, um, and she's uh, uh, she came here uh, leaving her uh, eight week old, um, so we know that her heart is is not entirely here, <laughs> um, but we have the rest of her, and uh, she's offered to talk about uh, uh, what's what's coming up in uh, Drupal eight, and to uh, help us discuss how. Uh, the, the future of Drupal and the future of Drupal uh, for science and uh, for uh, NASA and other places uh, will, can proceed uh, and how we can work together. So, Angie, thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Bruce. All right. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm here today to talk to you about Drupal 8. Um, just a little bit about me. I mean, you covered most of it. I, uh, oh. Am I having a problem? No, okay, we just uh, we have to mute this. Uh, oh, what is that? This one here. Let's see this. Out. Might already be. Or are we hearing an echo back there? Mm. Okay. Hello, hello. Okay. Better. Cool. Marginally. Marginally. It might be. Oh, you know, me. actually, we have to uh, mute you. Right. Over here. Oh, over here. Okay. My microphone is muted on my computer, but maybe it's super. How about that? There. Yeah, good? Okay. Yeah, that is really annoying when there's super echo going on. Um, so yeah, I work at uh, Acquia in the office of the CTO. So Dries Bytart is the uh, founder and creator of Drupal and he's my boss, so no pressure there or anything. <laughs> and what I do is, uh, I was telling Kevin, what I do is a lot of uh, coordination within the community. So I grew up as a core developer, and then I sort of got into reviewing other people's patches, and then that sort of got me into being a core maintainer, which means I'm one of five people who can press the commit button on Drupal core and actually make changes to it. So I work with the thousand or so developers all over the world who work on Drupal itself, and I help coordinate with them. I help review their patches, make sure they're performant, and they are good with coding standards, and um, not introducing other problems, that kind of stuff. So uh, that's what I fill my days with, mostly. A lot of traveling, a lot of meeting with contributors all over the world. Um, I'm also a board member for the Drupal Association, uh, which is the uh, nonprofit organization that supports the Drupal project. I wrote a book once, never doing that again. And uh, I also work with the Spark team, and we'll talk about Spark a little bit. <coughs> and as of eight weeks ago, I'm a new mom. So, <laughs> yay! That's Lily. She's really cute. And my heart is mostly with you guys, but she's pretty sweet, so you know. Um, so the agenda today is we were going to talk about uh, Drupal 8, which is in the future still. It's a little bit science fiction, but not too bad. And since you're all science folks, I figure a little science fiction is probably pretty fun. Um, we'll talk about what's planned in Drupal 8 for end users and clients, site builders, designers and themers, developers, and then we'll get into the questions you probably actually have, which is like, when can I use it, when will it be ready, that sort of stuff. Because I want to tell you all the cool stuff first, and then we'll get into the you know, stuff you want to know. Um, so I don't know everyone in the room here. I had lunch with a couple of you. How many people would consider themselves kind of end users, or we also call them victims of Drupal? So you have to use Drupal for your job, but it's not by choice. Okay, so like third of the room. And then how many people would classify themselves as site builders? You spend your days in views and organic groups and that kind of stuff. Pretty much the same people. I'm so sorry. So you're a victim and you're thrust into having to deal with views all day. Okay. Um, designers or themers or people? Yeah, I can't do that stuff either. Oh, a couple people. Okay, right on. You do everything. I'm just, you're raising your hand with every single thing. Um, and how about developers? That's like everybody else. Okay, so you guys are pretty hardcore. So... Um, the presentation's a little high level because I wasn't sure what the makeup of the crowd would be, but if you guys want to jump in on anything and like really dig into the code and start mecking around, let me know because I'm happy to do that stuff because I'm a developer as well. Okay, 
Um, so standard disclaimer, this stuff is accurate as of very late o'clock last night, but everything's changing constantly, so by now it might be incorrect in places. So just take that with a grain of salt. We'll first talk about changes for end users and clients. So we could do this a couple of ways. So I made a nice presentation that walks you through all the things, or we could be really dangerous and try and do a live demo. But you have to be like understanding that I'm doing a live demo on pre-alpha software, so it might break in the middle of everything. So who wants to do nice, safe presentation? Nobody. You're going to make me look bad. And this is being recorded for posterity? OK, that's cool. All right. And who wants to do an embarrassing live demo? Everybody. OK, that's cool. We'll do that. Um, so we'll talk about changes for end users and clients. One of the really big areas of focus that we did in Drupal 8 is around the authoring experience. Um, these are typical end users who have to use Drupal. I'm sure you've come across them. They're kind of angry. Um, they're angry because in Drupal 7, there's a lot of stuff that we have to fix. Um, so for example, if you look at a typical page in Drupal, this is an unthemed page, it's just raw Drupal here. Um, you know, you go in to edit it because you see some problem with it. And you get this form that looks nothing like what you just saw on the front end. It's this kind of abstraction of what used to be there. Um, and then you have funny things like, you know, having to hand type HTML tags by yourself, you know, like it's 1999 or something like that. Um, and you get all these overwhelming options, like what's a text format and what are these other things? And they're sort of all in your face, all of the options that you could possibly click on. And then when you go to preview what you just did, you get the thing you just typed twice and in the admin theme. So nothing approaching an actual preview that you would want to use at all, right? Have people experienced some of these problems? It's kind of frustrating, yeah? Okay, I'm very sorry. The good news is that we worked really hard to fix it. So I talked about Spark, that being a project that I've been working on. So Spark is, a, is an Aquila-led initiative to essentially look around at what co like other competitors are doing, user experience-wise, and try and either catch up to them or eclipse them even. And the way we went about it is we built a Drupal 7 distribution. So we built some tools that you could use right now on your sites to sort of vet them and then built those improvements into Drupal 8. We had a really big vision for how far we wanted to go and then it turned out Drupal 8 core development was a little tougher than we thought and so we didn't get quite as far in our vision but we did get a couple of pretty nice improvements and I'll show them to you in a sec. So one of the big ones is we got a WYSIWYG editor in core. Yay! Or boo, depending on your perspective. Yeah. I like to say this is us partying like it's 1999 because, you know, hand typing HTML is not really something that you do these days. Um, we had a huge, huge research bundle with this thing when we ended up doing a CK Editor as our editor of choice, but it's swappable, so if you want to use something else like Aloha or it's Tiny MCE or something like that, you can totally do it. It just doesn't ship with core. It's also, you can turn it off if you don't want it. And then we have in-place editing. And this is really cool because it allows you to actually click on the thing that you see has a typo in it and edit it right in place and then hit save without having to go back into the back admin form if you don't need to go back there. It only works on visual properties, but that's okay because you know we still have the nice back end form for you. And we've actually redesigned that back end form to be a lot more user friendly. So we have the stuff you actually need to fill out on the left side. And then on the right side, we have sort of the other settings that you don't need to worry about as much. And this isn't done yet, but in progress, we have a real preview system. Um, and how that's working is when you click preview, instead of getting your node twice in your admin theme, you actually see the front end of your site with the piece of content in whatever display mode that you choose. And there's a little selector at the top so you can say full or teaser or something like that. Um, I'd love to see that make it a decor. It's dubious at this point if it's going to or not because we're past code freeze and stuff, but it's a really, really important problem to solve. Um, so before we go to mobile, I'll just actually show you what the stuff I just talked about does. So uh, here I am in my demo site. Let's do this on prod, actually. So I go to content. Um, I go to add content, and I'll make an article. Um, and I'm going to need a G-rated noun. Anyone? Uh, carrot. Carrot. Whoop. Yeah, that's a good one. Let's get a really, really big carrot. Oh, come on. 
That was too big. <laughs> Let's try this one. Well, there we go. That, those are some big carrots. That is 3,648 pixels. Here, that, that should do. All right, so let's go ahead and save this. I'm going to type in my stuff. Mmm, carrots. Uh, tags, how about mmm, you know, yummy, orange. Any other suggestions? Root. Oh. What's that? Oh. Healthy, yeah. So you put them in Nutella, then they're a little less healthy, but you know. <laughs> All right. Pop that in there. And what do we want to say about carrots? Carrots are orange. <laughs> yes, they are orange. They're so orange, we're going to make that bold and italic. Um, hooray! We can just do that without having to remember strong tags and to close it, not type song instead of strong, because that never works. Um, and then if you view source, you can actually see that it keeps the semantic markup that you want. Um, it even handles paste from Word, which is pretty awesome. So when you paste from Word, it'll clean it all up and make it all nice with the P tags, and it'll cut out all the annoying fonts and stuff that you don't want. So very cool. Uh, you have a few options down here. You can save and publish, save as unpublished. Uh, we also introduced a draft mode in Core, which is not actually exposed in the UI, but a, uh, something like the Workbench module will be able to make use of that. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and save this. Oh, OK, we need to find a little bit smaller image of a carrot. Sorry, it exceeded two megabytes. I wasn't counting on that. Uh, here, that's going to work. Live demos, people. They're very dangerous. All right. Mmm, carrots. Now, let's say that we wanted to say something other than carrots are orange. We forgot to also mention that they're delicious. Um, what I can do is I can actually, if I hover over here, I get a little uh, doohickey here. Uh, these are little quick edit icons. If I click here and I click quick edit, now all of the fields on this, I can just click and start typing. So if I want to add another tag in here, like bunnies, uh, I can do that. If I want to head down here and say, and delicious, and maybe I want that in a bulleted list, because why not? Um, I can click Save, and it'll actually save this directly uh, without me having to go to a backend form or anything like that. If I go back to my demo site, you can see that now it says it's bunnies, and it says orange and delicious. So right like that, I was able to edit that without having to go mungling to a different screen. Um, so those are some of the kinds of things that we worked on in Drupal 8. It hopefully makes the uh, editing of content a lot, lot easier than it used to be. Andrew, would you like to save questions for the end? Or? No, hit me. Uh, so the, the back end of that, like the specific one field editing, is that um, an API that we can use even programmatically? It's, yeah, it's using the, you know, um, the temp store that Views has? Okay. What it's doing is until you click the save button, it's saving the results of what you're doing to a temp store. Okay. And then when you click the save button, it just does a regular node save, just like you would do for any other kind of API call. So all of the things that you're used to, like your workflow changes, all that kind of stuff, it will just behave exactly like if you had clicked edit and then click save on the big form. Um, so yeah, API wise, it's just a standard. Just the okay. Yep. Yeah, good question. What about like validation issues? If you get oh, sure. So let's let's do one of those. Um, how can I make a validation issue? Um, remove. How about I upload a? Two big file. Yeah, I could upload it. My two big file. Yeah, let me do that. Um, this used to work. I hope it still does. <laughs> Yeah, cool. So it just shows the uh, validation error right in line so you can fix whatever the problem was and then move on with your day. Yeah. Um, it also was, up until a second ago, I think there's a bug right now, it was completely keyboard accessible. So I could tab to all these things. I hit enter. I can go into all of this stuff. Um, so it's WCAG uh, AA compliant. And not don't think we're at AAA because that's a little bit insane. But um, yeah. Good stuff. All right, now let's talk about mobile. 
Um, so mobile is obviously a huge issue. I mean, uh, we had a presentation on that earlier about how we have device sizes getting smaller, we have devices sizes getting bigger. Uh, we have no idea what things are going to come down the pipe, and so mobile has been a huge focus for us. Um, because Dries really sees this as a huge opportunity. Um, you know, we look at, you know, we have a big opportunity just converting all of the websites that are out there to Drupal sites, but let alone all of the people out there that are using something that's not a desktop computer. It's huge and it's only going to get bigger. Uh, so we need, really need our, uh, our default CMS to be able to deal with that. And we're trying to solve this kind of stuff. So if you've ever tried Drupal 7, with a mobile browser out of the box. Now, you can download responsive themes in Drupal 7, everything's fine, but out of the box, that has a pretty bad impression because you have like scroll bars everywhere, you know, and then if you do have a responsive theme, the toolbar starts doing that, which is not very nice, you know? Um, so we want to fix all of that stuff. And so we worked on a few different things. Uh, one is that all of the themes in core are responsive out of the box. Um, we also have responsive images and uh, the ability to configure breakpoints and assign layouts to those. Um, we also have a mobile-friendly admin theme. So um, we have this toolbar that if you have it across the top on a desktop browser, will just show you all of the icons with the text and stuff like that. In a mobile browser, it will flip to a vertical orientation and then it will compress all the icon or all the text to just little icons, similar to how Twitter does it and other types of sites like that. Um, and we also have uh, APIs that you as developers can use for things like responsive tables. So you can declare columns as being important or medium or low importance, and then it will drop those columns off as the screen size gets bigger and smaller. And this is also built into the views module if you're familiar with that. Um, and this is not done yet, but something that we're also working on is uh, the ability to preview uh, what your site is going to look like in a facsimile of a mobile browser. So you can set up presets that are like an iPhone or a Nexus 7 or whatever, and then you can both preview the thing and what it's going to look like, and you can also flip the orientation of that. So you can see what it'll look like in landscape mode or portrait mode. And it's not 100%, obviously. It's not the same as owning $25,000 worth of hardware and keeping a huge basket of every device ever known to mankind, but, you know, it gets the job done for the basics, and then you can start debugging really bad problems. Uh, Front-end performance has also been a big focus of ours, and we're not there yet, um, but we've done a lot of different things like trying to optimize JavaScript and CSS compression, uh, doing things like moving the JavaScript to the bottom of the, f of the document so that it loads after the rest of the document, uh, things like converting a lot of stuff that was jQuery to just raw JavaScript because JavaScript's a lot faster. jQuery doesn't load at all now for anonymous page views. Um, it will load for uh, authenticated user page views. Um, so let's take a look at that stuff. Um, so the first thing I'll show you is the responsive toolbar. So see how this is all horizontal and such? If I take my browser and I shrink it like this, it automatically flips back and forth to vertical orientation. Or you can do that manually if you want with this little button here. Um, and if I pull that up in a mobile browser, uh, not that. Um, you can see that it's all compressed. And even though that image was very wide, actually, let me click on the actual thing. Uh, whoa! Sorry, folks, I'm not very good at navigating in this little thing. Even though that image is very wide, when I look at it in the desktop browser, you can see that in the mobile browser, it shrunk it down so it fits nicely. That's the picture module that does responsive images. Yep. And also the features, this isn't going to work, but I'll just show you how it should work. Um, but features like that quick edit thing that I showed you, by the time we ship Drupal 8, this will work better than it does now, but I'll show you what it does. Um, but I can flip on uh, this little toggle, and that will, because on mobile you don't have a hover action, right? Because they haven't yet inv you know, invented telepathic iPads, but it's a matter of time. <laughs> but, um, so I can toggle that on to get these little quick release things, and then I can click quick edit, and just like I can on the browser, I can start to enter my alt text. And come up here. Hopefully that will fire a form updated. Oh, I don't think you did. Anyway, 
we're fixing it as we speak. If there's a bug in the queue, anyway. Um, the save button should appear up there. But by the time we ship Drupal 8, you'll be able to do all of this front-end development or front-end editing stuff in a mobile browser as well, which is really important for, say, if you're a media company and you're covering a sports event, you're not going to run back up and get your laptop in order to edit a story. You want to be right there on the floor with your iPad or whatever you've got on you and just updating with pictures and whatever. So that's how that goes. Um, yeah. Any questions on mobile stuff at all? As Eric mentioned earlier, you can do all this right now, grab Twitter bootstrap as a base theme and all that kind of stuff, but having it built out of the box is important for first impressions and things like that. Does having it in core make it easier to do the rest of it? Yeah. Um, well, the responsive, having the APIs in core to do like responsive images and responsive tables and things like that, uh, there's also APIs to do um, like the little mobile, well, I'll get to that in a second, but the little mobile uh, uh, HTML5 form elements that, you know, let you do email or number. Having those APIs in core is definitely easier because then you don't need to grab a bunch of contrib stuff in order to just get your site working. Um, so all that stuff's taken care of for you, so you don't even have to think about that. You can focus more on, okay, what does my site look like? Does it have the right branding? The stuff that you should be worrying about when you're making a site. Is there a way to, is there an interface to control how regions Yeah, the question was, is there an interface to, to control how the breakpoints like change when the, or sorry, how the regions change when the breakpoints move around? We worked really hard on that tool, and it did not make it into core. And so it's just kind of sitting on the shelf for now. It's called, uh, what is it called? Gosh, it's been a while since I looked at that. It's called the layout module, I think? Or is it the layouts module? Yeah. So we built this cool little tool where you can like design your own responsive layouts and various different screen widths and things like that. Um, it's only in Drupal 7 at the moment, um, and it works with panels, sort of. Um, it's not definitely not production ready at all. Um, the blocks and layouts initiative in Drupal 8 didn't get quite as far as we had hoped, and so we kind of had to scrap that plan, unfortunately. But um, we'll continue to work on this in Contrib um, in both Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 and try and make it into something pretty cool. Because, uh, yeah, that type of functionality for people who aren't designers, like me, I don't know how to make a responsive theme, but I know how to click buttons and make, you know, little layouts show in different ways. <laughs> so, yeah. But what this, this module does is it lets you set up um, various screen sizes and then you can add regions and click and drag them around and all that kind of stuff. So that was something we did as a sort of an R&D project within the Spark team. Not production ready, did I mention that? But it's fun to play around with, and hey, we're looking for color maintainers, so you know, like if you, if you feel like fancy, you know. Cool. Oops. So I'm gonna talk about changes for site builders. Uh, the biggest one is we got views in core. Yay, or ooh, depending on your perspective. How many people are yay views people? Oh, I'll just about everybody. All right, how many people are like, screw that, I can write my own sequel? <laughs> Nobody? Okay, that's great. Because there's always one in the crowd, you know. But uh, yeah, so views being core is, is a really big deal. It means that out of the box with Drupal 8, you can actually build a website now. Like, <laughs> you couldn't really do that in Drupal 7, right? In Drupal 7, you'd have to get your thing for the responsive design, you have to get the views, and you get the WYSIWYG editor, and you get all this stuff. And with Drupal 8, as soon as Drupal 8 ships, you'll actually be able to make pretty sophisticated websites right out of the go. So we're really excited about that. Um, if you don't know what views is, um, views is the listomatic module, I call it. It's a way, without writing any code, to create anything that's a list of stuff. So creating bulleted or numbered lists, galleries, tables, calendars, XML or JSON feeds, anything that you can imagine that is a list of content, even if it's a list of one, you can make it with a view. Um, so I pulled a couple of websites. Um, I hope this isn't offensive to anyone. I looked at the members of ESIP and anyway. <laughs> so uh, this was what I found. And this is not a Drupal site, but if it were, um, you could kind of start to look for what things might be lists that we could turn into views. Do you guys have any suggestions if you're looking at this? What might make sense? What looks like a list on this page? From the newsroom. What's that? The newsroom, yeah, right here. Yep. So from the newsroom, that's a list of content titles, probably, with a little feed attached to it. That's totally a view. Any, any other ones? You 
future stories? Future stories. Why do I not future, see that? The slider. The, the slider. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And you wouldn't think, right? Because it doesn't look like a, a list, but it totally is. There's like a little do -do 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 down here. And it's just displayed in a cool way to make it seem fancy. Um, yeah, so when I looked at this, I kind of saw, you know, a bulleted list over here, a bulleted list down there, and then a slideshow listing up here. Um, the NASA website actually is, oh, no, I ruined it. Anyway. <laughs> Hold on. You didn't see that. Uh, why can't I duplicate it? There we go. <laughs> Oh, well, anyway, I think that's going to have to, okay, that never happened. See, watch this. Wow, look, and so it's the NASA website. What do you guys think are views on this website? Pretty much everything is a view on this website. Anybody want to call out a couple of particulars? And again, I don't know if they actually are views in real life, but they could be. Yeah, events over here. Do you see that's a... Next previous thing, it's like a little slider that keeps going through. Then you have some little links on the bottom that would just be in the footer. We got another one of those slideshow things. This one's fancy. Whoever did this is very talented. They made it all look really nice. Are you in the room, person who built this website? No. No? Okay. It's, that's a good job. Um, images, multimedia, tweets, all that kind of stuff. That would all be lists as well. So. You know, it's just, it's just a trying to training your brain to like look at a mock-up and stuff like that and tease out which of those things can be views. Because um, the great thing about views is that it not only will pull the list up, but you can also control things like what the title is and how many records it shows and all these other kinds of things without having to write code. Um, yeah? The popular topics could be a view too, as if there's a jump box view style. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. I forgot about that, yes. Owen's pointing out that popular topics could also be a view because there's a jump box style of view. So you have a list of things in a, in a, in a drop down and you can format it that way. So good call. I'm fired. Uh, um, so yeah, everything about views that you know and love is here and then a bunch of other things. So some of those other things are the ability to uh, create uh, rest exports of views. We'll get into web services stuff later. Uh, that's in there out of the box. Um, some of the stuff we made more pluggable, like header and footer text, so you can share that between views. Um, things like the being able to specify, oh, we can specify HTML tags in the views now, so you don't need uh, semantic views um, was the module you needed for that back in the day. Um, yeah, all kinds of stuff, responsive tables, basically anything we expose as an API in Drupal 8 got incorporated into views. And putting views in core was one of the best things we ever did because it uh, really helped to validate all of the stuff that we were doing. Like, we make all these crazy APIs and we hope they work, but views was a way to tell that, no, they don't work, but we can fix them so they do <laughs> well in advance of anybody else having to deal with it. So it was great. Multilingual is also a, a big area of focus for us. Um, multilingual is... Uh, Things like we put multilingual first. So when you install Drupal normally, you get this th selection that says, what installation profile do you want? And can you imagine, first of all, in English, what's an installation profile? But if you were trying to read that in Hungarian or something and understand what that would be, silly. So this way, you can actually select a language right out of the gate. And then when you select something like French, what it'll do is it'll contact the Drupal translation server and automatically download the French translation of the installer. So you can go through the entire installer in your language without having to mess with it. Did anyone here, here ever build multilingual sites with Drupal? Okay, so you know it is not like that in Drupal 7. You have to like download a tarball and extract it in a certain way and put it in a certain place and it's very finicky. Um, so that's really cool to have that sort of tie in directly with translate.drupal.org. Um, you can also download translation updates through the UI. So just like in Drupal 7, you can download module updates through the UI. Now in Drupal 8, you can actually get updates to your translations through the UI. So you can just click a button and get the translation. You don't have to mess with putting files in places and, and things like that. Um, we also made a bunch of usability improvements. This, won't, this screen won't make sense if you have never done a multilingual site, but normally configuring different fields to be multilingual is going to each field's configuration screen individually and doing that and it takes hours. And we've developed screens where you can just say, I want content types enabled, articles, these fields, done. Um, so it speeds things up quite a bit. 
Um, and we have translatable entities. So in Drupal 7, you have to download a lot of extra modules in order to get this functionality, but basically you can make some of your nodes English and some of your nodes French. <laughs> See that? Cat's got a beret. Anyway, <laughs> so, yes. And you only need three modules for all this, as opposed to 12 or something that it was in 777. Um, and while I have this screenshot up, this is another really cool thing we did. We added a search box to the modules page. Yay! Yay! I know, that's like my favorite thing. So, you know, if you want to try and find panels, you don't have to search through all of this stuff. You also notice, like, we hid a lot of information, so all the dependencies aren't showing up unless you want to know that information. Things like that, so, yeah. Pretty cool. Lots of other stuff too. We uh, now require PHP 5.3.10, which is kind of a steepish upgrade, but by the time Drupal 8's out, it should be fairly, uh, fairly standard. Um, we also added a new tour module, which can provide contextual help for, uh, for whatever you might be doing. We haven't actually gotten around to writing the help text for it yet, but we have a couple of issues going for that. Like, so people can actually figure out views and field UI and things like that. Um, hopefully the first time they go in there. We added a bunch of new fields to Drupal core, so link, email, phone, entity reference, and date are all native fields, so you don't need contrib modules to get all of those. Um, and then we pulled a bunch of modules out of core uh, that were sort of languishing and not really being used by anybody. Uh, dashboard, poll, blog, trigger, profile, open ID, and the Garland theme. Wah, wah. So. Um, those projects still live in Contrib, although Contrib projects that got pulled out of core don't statistically have a very high rate of success. So if you need any of those, uh, you might want to take on ownership of them. But the thinking there was that um, they're not getting developed very much in core. Like, people just don't care about them. Uh, so we're thinking if we give them a life in Contrib, then somebody who's really passionate about polls might be able to take that and run with it. And maybe it could go back into core someday. Interesting poll Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, in some ways, you'd be using Drupal and you think WordPress. Right. You know, people, you know, the one the blog that is doing WordPress. Yeah, and the reason we pulled that out is because it was very confusing. Like, people would think they needed blog module because they want a blog. But unless you were doing a multi user blog, you really don't need blog module. You just make articles and you're done. That's your blog. Um, so yeah, it is interesting though that that was, a that was a heated discussion because that is actually a useful module that it is, you, I don't think you can actually replicate everything that module does with contrib because it does all kinds of things. It adds funny bread marks or I'm sorry, breadcrumbs to your user profile, things like that. Like you could probably replicate it, but it would be tricky. Um, versus, you know, one checkbox and you're done in core right now. So, but that was how we landed on that. Yeah. Do you, you pulled out OpenID? We um, did. It's, it's not being used? We pulled out OpenID mainly a lot of these things we pull them out because they're not being maintained and the people who fix bugs in Drupal core get sick and tired of fixing bugs in modules no one cares about. That's primarily the reason we remove stuff. But yeah, we find that uh, OpenID is not really taken off the way people hoped. Um, sadly, most people are on like Google uh, Google Plus or Facebook login because it's so easy, you know. Um, Do you have like a lot two or something in there? No, we just have nothing. We're leaving it to contrib, essentially. Because what makes sense to move into Drupal core is something that's a clear winner in that field, and basically there isn't one. And OAuth 2 is a mess as well, um, from what I understand. And there's Mozilla Persona, which is actually pretty cool. Um, but, you know, we don't really have anybody really interested in the open identification stuff or open identity stuff to enough to like maintain that for Drupal core. So, um, so we're going to leave it a cycle and uh, see what happens if somebody makes a kick-ass OAuth 2 module in, in Drupal contrib during the Drupal 8 cycle, we'll probably pull it in in Drupal 9 because that would help with a bunch of stuff like web service authentication and lots of other things. Yeah. Any other questions or comments about site builder improvements? Otherwise, I can get into changes for designers and front-end developers, which was none of us, but there's still some pretty cool stuff in here. Um, HTML5 is a new thing, so out of the box, Drupal's outputting native HTML5 output, article tags, section tags, um, you know, things like that. 
Um, we also included HTML5 form elements. So as a module developer, since we're all module developers, you can create form elements that are of type telephone or email or whatever. And then what they'll do is on a browser like an iPhone or whatever that supports those fields, it'll actually reduce the keyboard that they see. So if it's a phone number field, there's no sense in like showing them the whole alphabet. Just show them numbers that they can type in. Um, and it speeds things along quite a bit mobile-wise. Um, in HTML5, if you're not familiar with it, because I definitely wasn't familiar with it before I got into Drupal and stuff, um, all of those, if people have older browsers that don't support email or telephone, will just fall back to a regular text field. So there's no harm in using those at all. If a user agent doesn't understand it, it'll just fall back to a normal input. A uh, bunch of markups changed from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. Uh, we have like these funny viewport type of meta names. Eric talked about that earlier, how that makes the site so it doesn't you know, look really small on a mobile device. It kind of expands it out. So we have the mobile stuff in there. Um, we've added HTML attributes so you can put other things other than RDFA into the markup. Um, we also added a new templating system called Twig, which we got from Symfony. And so if you're used to PHP template, this will look a little bit funny to you. There's no PHP in these files at all. So if you want to do PHP stuff, you have to do it in the pre-process layer or the process layer, like one step before this. Um, and what you see here are little brackety signs. It's almost like smarty or something like in that way. And if you see brackety brackety something, it means print this. So you're printing out a variable or you're printing out the result of a function or something like that. If you see uh, percent signs around it, it means do this logic. So it's going to call a function. It's going to check, basically do some PHP logic. And if you see comments or pound signs, that means it's commented out. Um, and Twig has gotten a lot of movement around it by the front end developers because a lot of them are primarily Photoshop and Dreamweaver people who came to Drupal and suddenly had to learn PHP in order to get their job done. And that was quite a learning curve for them because they never had to do that in any other system they use, like Expression Engine or WordPress or things like that. Um, and so this way it's a very clean separation between presentation and logic. Uh, so you don't end up with like 50 line SQL queries and your template files running all the time, which I love as a developer. Um, it's also going to be better for security as well. Um, because pretty much the number one reason people get security holes in their website, especially cross-site vulnerabilities and things like that, is because people just print raw variables and they don't think to escape them. So with Twig, everything's escaped automatically out of the box. You don't have to mess with that yourself. So Pretty cool. Um, also on the markup front, uh, native schema.org uh, compatible RDFA output is there. Does anyone know what that means? Yay, okay. Could you explain it to me? Sure. So, um, schema.org um, has a series of basically content types representing things like events and products and data sets and um, it allows semantic markup of the, of the markup of the pages so that they can be called and found without sort of having things explicitly appear on the page. So the regular search engine can find your pages. Yep. So what he said, I'll just paraphrase, and you can tell me if I got it right or not, <laughs> was schema.org essentially defines a bunch of content types for things like people or events or things like that. Um, and then you build that description right into the markup of the page so that a regular old search engine just in its regular crawling duties can actually tease out that that's not just a div, that's a div describing a person, and then it can do other things with that. Is that correct? That's correct. It's not complete magic because uh, you have to get the major search engines to go and recognize that the annotations are in RDFA, so right. snippets and, and so on. Uh, but there's a session this afternoon on this for, for data sets, and I think it's a really good direction to go. Awesome. Yeah, he said it's not a magic bullet because you got to get all the search engines to parse RDFA and actually you know, understand what those things are, but um, there's actually a session on that later on this afternoon if people want to attend that and talk more about it. But yeah, I, as a, you know, as a developer of a major CMS powering 2% of the internet, I get excited about stuff like this because it means that without anyone having to think, they set up a little Drupal site and then it's an open data repository out there on the internet. So 
Um, so I get really happy about stuff like that, even though I don't quite know why I would use it yet. Yes? As far as I know, um, I'm trying to read this. It's kind of small. It's even smaller for you because you have this on your screen. I believe core ships pointing to a specific DTD or whatever it is for schema.org for that version. So it would we treat it kind of like jQuery update where um, as newer versions of schema.org came around, you'd just get a contrib module that would update the doc type to that instead. I believe is how we would do it. Because I think if we just pointed to essentially their master branch or whatever, I'm getting my terms wrong, but you know what I'm saying, that that might cause problems because all of a sudden these weird attributes would be showing up and it might cause problems with CSS or whatever in people's live sites. So, But yeah, all of this stuff is in this, uh, it, it's a Drupal attributes um, API and other modules can add things to that or take things away from it. It's all alterable. But yeah, so that's that's pretty nice. The RDFA output in Drupal 7 um, was a really good start, but it's not quite there yet. And this is actually not quite there yet either. If anybody's really interested in this, um, I could hook you up with Lynn Clark, who's kind of been driving a lot of this stuff, and she has a whole litany of things that she she really needs reviews on. She's doing a lot of the development, but she doesn't have like a partner in crime to like help her see that through. Um, and then on a sad note, we killed off support for IE6 and 7. And, uh, and IE8 is kind of on life support, too. <laughs> so, um, But we figured the uh, usage stats-wise, stats 6 and 7 are going to be pretty much irrelevant by the end of the year. Um, 8 is a little questionable. That might hang on a lot longer because of XP. But on the other hand, mobile is becoming such a huge thing that it might actually become irrelevant as well as people move away from their desktop machines, except in China. Um, so, yeah. In, Drew, in, in IE8, what will happen is you'll just get kind of like a no JavaScript experience where it's just a single column and, you know, everything's functional, but it doesn't look very nice. And now we get into changes for coders. Hey, coders. Any questions on changes for front-end developers at all? Is this useful? Like, do you like... Okay, okay cool. All right. Sweet. So changes for coders. Things are about to get geeky. This is my favorite part. So web services. Um, so earlier today, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. Ajinga. Ajinga? Yeah. OK. This gentleman <laughs> demoed the services module in Drupal 7 and how that could expose a JSON endpoint that you could then talk to in the, uh, in the uh, Android um, application creator thing. Um, so in Drupal 8, we ship with a module called RESTful Web Services that does that out of the box, which is awesome. Um, the problem that we're trying to solve with the web services thing is that Drupal 7 assumes that every single time it serves a page, it's going to a browser on a desktop machine. So it wraps it all in the HTML and the theme and it starts up the form API and everything that it needs to do and then it goes, here you go, even if that request is actually just JSON to fill out an autocomplete field or something like that. It's not very smart. In order to actually do something other than serve an HTML page, it actually has to kill the request before it gets to the theme system, which is pretty janky. And nowadays, you know, we want to talk to Drupal with everything. We want to talk to Drupal with, you know, well, not Flash. Anyways, <laughs> but, you know, iPhones, desktops, other Drupal sites, everything needs to talk to Drupal. We're entering into this world where you can't assume anything about what's on the other end because you literally don't know. The only thing you know is that there's a request coming in, you need to serve out a response as quickly as possible. Um, and so what we've done in Drupal 8 is we've leveraged a bunch of Symfony components. Symfony is a PHP framework uh, that's developed by uh, Fabian Potentier and a, a community of people from Sensio Labs. Um, anybody here use Symfony before? Nobody? This URL is super long. I'll, I'll get a better URL or I'll tweet it or something like that. But anyway, this URL is actually great because I had no idea about Symfony and it all sounded like newfangled object-oriented muckety-muck to me. Um, but this uh, tutorial is actually great because it <coughs> <coughs> takes you from a very simple PHP application that anyone can understand um, that's just taking raw get variables and sort of like 
printing it directly to the screen and he goes into like why that's not a good idea and then it sort of over time introduces all these different symphony components so you see why you would do this versus that versus the other thing um, please don't copy that URL down I'll tweet it out and you can just do that because I feel so bad it's like this long um, so the symphony components some of the symphony components we're using is the symphony kernel which is essentially like the bootstrap.inc of symphony it's the thing that actually powers up the, uh, the machine we're using the Symphony routing component, which is uh, a replacement for hook menu in Drupal 7. Uh, so what you do now, instead of making this hook menu that's like this long PHP function with percent signs and you know these magic numbers of like array two that passes in a thing to something else, um, now you have all these YAML files. If you like YAML, you'll love Drupal 8. It's all YAML all the time. If you don't know what YAML is, it's just a little kind of text-based thing, it's almost like an INI file, something colon something else, but it can, it's actually able to express quite rich uh, text, you know, it's, it's able to express objects versus arrays versus other things, which some of the other formats that we looked at, like JSON, are not quite able to do. Um, so you write your hook menu de declaration essentially like this um, in a YAML file, and then much the same way as Drupal 7 worked, you know, a request comes in, it has a path attached, but unlike Drupal 7, where it only looked at the path and then spat back whatever, it also takes into account the uh, application type that's coming, or the content type, I'm sorry, that's coming in, as well as the HTTP method that's coming in. So we can actually derive off all of those things. So if it's an HTTP GET request for HTML, then it will fire up a theme system and everything. But if it's just a GET request for application JSON, then it will only fire up the files it needs to serve that request, and it won't fire up everything else. Um, so how it works generally is a request comes in, that goes to a controller, which is like index.php in our case. Um, that passes out to the Symphony kernel, which looks up on the routing system and says, hey, this is the URL. Do they have permission to look at that? And what callback should it be pointing to? And in Drupal 7, the callbacks are always functions. And in Drupal 8, they're always methods on an object. So you have to actually make classes and actually define a method in the class that returns the results of whatever you're doing. And instead of returning a string or a render array like they would in Drupal 7, what you'd be returning is a response. And there are different types of responses. There's Ajax response, JSON response, uh, there's HTML response, there's a couple of other ones. Um, and it's nice because no matter what the request is that comes in, the, the coming out, it's exactly the same flow. Versus in Drupal 7, it was very like it, it very much had to do backflips in order to not do the default thing that it wanted to do. And just a quick question. Um, yeah. So for content negotiation, like asking for RDF files or XML versions of your nodes or whatever, Yep. Um, is that in core or do we still need REST or US? Or? Uh, that's in core. Well, so what's in core, flip to the next slide. Um, what's in core is the RESTful web services module. Um, and it ships by default with just JSON, raw JSON. We also have a HAL, H-A-L, which I can't remember what that stands for, but it's like uh, JSON that knows something about linked data. Um, we had JSON LD in there for a while, but it wasn't really a good fit for what we needed it to be. But essentially that's all pluggable. So I imagine what will happen is Contrib will come up with like the XML version and the SOAP version and all these other things. But in core, we're just going to have JSON and uh, how, those are the two. Um, but how REST module works is you turn it on and in the configuration file, you can enable it on whatever you want. So you can say on any entity in the system. So you can say, I want it on for nodes, users, and views for some reason, uh, but I don't want it on for anything else. Um, and you can also specify um, which HTTP methods are allowed, so get are allowed, but post is not, delete is not, these kinds of things. So it's actually really sophisticated the amount of configuration you can do. And then what you essentially do is you just give it a curl request, or you could use that fancy uh, postman thing or whatever you know you want to do. And then what you'll do is you'll get back a response like this. So it has uh, a bunch of information, and then it has the result of the node in JSON kind of all smushed together. And then once you have this raw information, then you can do things like uh, call the HTTP client in the Android API and turn that into a list of items, um, all those kinds of things. When you enable the RESTful module, you also get the option in views to create a display that's a RESTful uh, web service, and that can also decide between JSON or 
Hal or whatever you have enabled. So, um, so this is this is pretty cool stuff. I don't think anything's really going to ship with Drupal 8 that's going to make use of this, but someone could write the Drupal 8 app, you know, that could talk to any Drupal site and get views and you know all this kind of stuff. So, um, so if anybody likes programming Java, <laughs> just kidding, but uh, yeah. Um, any other questions on web, web services or Symfony or REST module or any of that kind of stuff? I can demo that. It's a little finicky, though. Um, but I, I, I could do it for you fine people because that's how much I care. Okay, I see your hand here and then here. So is there any online documentation about you know, how to use these uh, uh, web services? Yep. So there's, um, there's some really basic documentation here. Let me... Oh, I hope this doesn't screw up my whole thing. If it does, it was for a good cause, right? All right. Um, so if I turn on the RESTful Web Services module, uh, it needs the serialization module in order to work. Um, there is a help page, and that's it. This doesn't expose a UI. It did for a while, but then they, it was sort of like resource constrained, and it was like, we'd rather have a kick-ass REST module than a mediocre UI and a mediocre REST module, so they ripped out the UI. But um, at any rate, in here, there's a help page that takes you to um, what to do. And then, uh, where is that? This. This is a much longer version. So it talks about all the different ways that you can configure the REST module. Let me bump the font size up a little bit. Um, so you can enable it on nodes. Um, getting is fine. Posting, we only support HAL JSON, like all these different types of configuration that you can do. And that's kind of why they gave up on the UI is because there was just too many ways to, you know, too many checkboxes to expose or whatever. Um, but one checkbox that is in core, which is really nice, is there is a permissions uh, for all of these things. So if you were to enable, I don't think they'll show up here because I haven't enabled it on anything. But if you were, say, to enable um, the RESTful Web Services module on nodes, then you would get uh, permission checkboxes for all the roles to say, uh, does this role have the ability to issue, get, post, delete, update requests? Um, and so you could enable those only for administrator, or you could enable them for anonymous if you were feeling very, very lucky. <laughs> um, but so it's sort of a two-step. It's both security at the, what does the application actually expose? level so that it's not like as soon as I turn on this module suddenly everyone can get all my content. Um, but it's it's not only that but then it's also the uh, the permission of each of those different facets and which one which roles can use that. Does that make sense? Uh, and uh, in the Drupal 7 service there was the option like login for services module. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the API is probably very different. The the Drupal 8 service, like REST module, is a lot more like the REST WS module than it is the services module. Um, but but yeah, like I could, I mean, if we wanted to get really crazy, we could go in the code of um, uh, oh, you're right. This is a funny thing. So you know. You know, like when someone's a, a really big Drupal person, you know, and they, they see someone new to Drupal, and then the new person to Drupal always puts the contributed module in the modules directory in the root, and they go, ha, 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 sucker. You don't ever put the modules in the modules directory. You put it in the sites, all modules, blah, blah, blah. Well, in Drupal 8, we switched that. So now the top level modules directory is where you put the things, and then all the other stuff is under a core directory, which makes a lot of sense, but it always screws me up to this day. All right, anyway. Hell. Um, well, that's what it takes to make an API for one of these things now. Um, uh, this is what Drupal 8 code looks like, by the way. A lot of classes and a lot of use statements and a lot of methods and things like that. Um, so I don't know anything about the REST API. Um, but I do know that it's all uh, pretty much based off the REST WS module because it was the maintainers of the, those modules who actually put got this into core. Um, so, but yeah, you can definitely like make different subscribers to the serialization engine, and then they can output in different ways. Um, I don't know. 
I don't know about put requests and like different ways of formatting those. Probably though. Um, I'm just not sure what all the different hook points are. Um, but that sounds like a very good study lesson and you can report back to the rest of the class on what you find out. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, but, uh, and make a YouTube video about it. You'll be famous. I'm the one person who understands how REST module works. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's still a bit rough, and I'll say that. Like every time I go to like set up a demo, I hit fifteen different things that like the rest command was slightly off, or you know this thing in CMI changed or whatever. It's 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 changing really fast right now, but we'll get it all ironed out by the end. But yeah, if you if that's something you're interested in helping with, talk to me, and we'll figure that out after. And I'm very sorry because you had a hand up like no, 25 you, minutes you ago. Got to what I was looking for, so I'm oh, oh, okay, good. What were you looking for? So uh, my question is kind of in terms of integration, like how much of it is like, yes, I want to just expose, this is what I'm exposing, you know, mm -hmm. visually through Drupal, I just want to be able to consume this with a, you know, a RESTful client versus how much do I actually, you know, am I dropping down editing or out of configuration and yep. everything else? So basically, I don't know where that, I guess I had it open here. Um, this page. Yeah, so there's there's a bunch of different things that you can do. Like this is a crazy example of you would never actually configure something this way, but this is just to show you all of the ways that you can configure it. So you can, for example, enable RESTful web services on taxonomy terms, but only get and only in JSON or XML and not in something else. So there's a multiple different ways that you can limit those things down. So the I'll ask a question a little bit different. Yep. Um, if you were using Drupal largely as kind of a backend store, like you need to stand up a RESTful API, is you, are you doing it wrong if you just kind of stand up Drupal and then you know, use the REST module to expose the RESTful API and just kind of using Drupal as a backend store to that? Are you... No, I don't think so. So the question was if you just use Drupal, if you basically just turn on Drupal and import all your data and turn on the REST module and let it sit there and let other things get requests from it, are you doing it wrong? I don't think so. Other than Drupal might be a little heavier than what you need to just spit out some JSON real fast. Like, um, Drupal's intended to do like access checking and like all these other fancy things. So if you didn't need that overhead, it might not be exactly the right tool. But on the other hand, part of the advantage of moving everything to classes and things like that is that uh, the bootstrap process is not currently faster, but can be faster because it lazy loads only what it needs as opposed to in, when everything's procedural, you have to chuck the whole thing into memory, even if you're never ever gonna call those functions on a request. Um, and so we managed to strip out a lot of the bloat in the bootstrap process. So it'll be, when we ship Drupal 8, it'll be faster, but it's still not gonna be as fast as like, I have a MongoDB store and I have a three line Node.js file that just, you know, that kind of thing. So that's what I would say about that. But yeah, I think if you wanted a data store with content management features, Drupal would be a great choice. All right. Any other questions on the web services stuff? Obviously, this is of interest to you guys. But I also want to talk about the next cool thing, which is configuration management. How many people have dealt with trying to take a change that was on the dev site and move it to the live site? <laughs> yeah, is that why you all have dents in your forehead, like right there? No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, it's a little frustrating, right? Because, <laughs> you know, the thing that's so great about Drupal is that all you got to do is click things and stuff happens, right? It's like, oh, I just, I want to change a few, I'll click things and it'll have, oh, and I want to change this and I'll click things. And then the problem is that both the configuration and the content are stored in the same database. And so you can't just move stuff from your database to the other database because what will happen is you'll overwrite your actual node 4 with a node 4 that's just a test module from your, from your dev site, which wouldn't make any sense, right? And so we invented all kinds of crazy ways to get around this problem, right? We invented update functions and you call variable set and variable get in there and then people are like, update functions are a pain. No, we should, we should make features, but they only work for certain things and not for other things. And then some things are C tools exportables, but not other things. And so it's just kind of a mess. It's gotten a lot better, 
but you never wanted to be that bleeding edge, you know, warrior who was like, I'm the first person to ever want to export an Ubercart product. Ooh, this isn't going to go well. Um, because that was always a harrowing experience. Um, so in Drupal 8, we have file-based configuration. So every time you click save configuration, instead of writing it, actually it writes it to the database too, but primarily it writes it to the file system. And then the file system, all these files are cached because it would be very slow to read 300 files on every request. By default, it caches it to a database table, just like the variables table in Drupal 7, but you could swap that out for something like Redis or like memcache or something like that if you wanted to do that instead. So the advantage of this is that it keeps your configuration separate from the content in your database. So you can move files over just like you would move module files or any other file in your version control system from one site to the other and then it will all work. So I have slides that very painstakingly you know, take us through this whole thing or we could try it live and see if it works. What do you guys want to do? I know what you want to do. You want me to look like an idiot. All right, let's go. So I have two sites. I have dev and I have prod. And it's actually gonna be a lot easier to keep these straight because one of them has carrots and the other one doesn't. The one with carrots is production because that's where we do our content. The one without carrots is dev. I tried to figure out how to like set the Bartik color scheme differently, but there's a bug and I couldn't do it. But anyway, I tried, I tried. We'll fix it all before Drupal 8 ships. All right, so we have development and we have production. So um, let's do some simple stuff first. Let's go ahead and go to configuration, site information. Let's add a slogan. What was the slogan you said? North Carolina is? Oh, it's a state that outlawed uh, climate change. Yes, that's a great idea. All right. So I'm gonna save it on my dev site. And if I go back to the home page, you can see now my demo site says North Carolina, the state that outlawed climate change. Are we gonna get into like trouble? Is this like a hot political topic? No. Okay. But if I go to my production site, I do not have that, okay? So going from one site to the other is a matter of, I think I broke it down to four steps. So you go to configuration, this is on dev. Go to configuration, configuration export. Click the export button and it'll export a copy of everything that's in your Active Directory. So all of the YAML files that are in there. Um, I go to my production site, I go to configuration, and I go to configuration import. And I find that file that I just downloaded, which is like config 12 at this point. And I click upload. And it'll take me to, ooh. Yeah, I thought it might do that, okay. Um, so I thought it would only show me the site information change, right? But instead it's showing me a couple of things. So can you guys see that okay back there? It says, well, not quite that big. It says there's one new configuration file since last time and two changed ones. And so my system site is there and I can click view differences and I can see, okay, that is what I expected. Um, but what's up with these two? And what happened is I enabled a module on development and so now it's saying, oh, you obviously want to enable this module on production. And so it's saying uh, REST module and serialization module are now there and um, we have a new file added and stuff like that. So what you do then is you sort of inspect the changes and you see how they're working and things like that. Um, you can also do this. Uh, hmm. No, this should work. Yeah. Yeah, I have a slide about that. I don't know if Drush actually works. I haven't tried that command. I didn't get that brave, but we can try it and see. Um, Owen didn't look very like, yeah. Um, if I have these files, I'll check in to get. I'm not sure why it's showing me all of those changes. But anyway, I can go, go ahead and do the diff from in here if I want. And it'll show me things like, I obviously haven't get updated this in a while. Um, and then if I look at this and I see, okay, everything looks cool, I can click, excuse me, import all. 
And then what it is going to do is copy those files which were in my staging directory into my active directory and then it overwrites the active store, it's called, with the new configuration. So if I go to home, I should see my slogan. Um, and if I go to extend, I probably will see the rest module on. Yeah. So anything that's configuration gets moved. Should we try something a little fancier? Can you just import part of the three items? Not in core. So in core, we're only supporting a full thing because we were driving ourselves bananas trying to get that to work. Um, but what I imagine features module is going to morph into is something that exposes a UI so that you can do that. Because, um, yeah, it's a fair point. It's like, I didn't actually want RESTful module enabled on my production site. I was just something I was dorking around with on dev. Yeah. So not in core, at least not yet. We'll see if we get there or not. Um, so I'll go to structure, content types. Let's add a content type. Any suggestions? How about planet? Planet. Oh, I like that one. Planets are round, usually. I don't know. You guys would know better Spheroid. than me. What's that? Spheroid. Oh, yes. Spheroid. I don't even know how to spell that. And Owen has a $40 word there. I don't know. OK. Um, let's add some fields. I don't know if this is going to work or not, but we'll see. Um, so maybe the uh, galaxy it's in? Milky Way. What are other galaxies? Andromeda. Oh, Andromeda. One more? Here to four unknown galaxy. Okay. And then let's set up a view that will only show planets. Where is views? Views isn't there. Views is under structure. Ah. So I'm going to make a planet that only shows type planet newest first, I'll create a page at planets, that sounds good, uh, and save. And then I just need to make one, so I'll add a planet, I'll call this one Earth. Um, That's a nice picture, and it's from the NASA website. There, nice. I'll add this one through the WYSIWYG editor just to be dangerous. Okay. Oh, that's going to be huge. Well, let's see what it does. And Galaxy is in Milky Way. Save. Ah. Oh, I know why that didn't work. I need this. The basic HTML won't uh, reference external URLs. It will only reference internal URLs just for a security thing. OK, so we have the planet Earth and such. Let's go ahead and redo. Do you remember how I exported that stuff? Yep. Down here. So I click my export button on dev, save, then on live, go here. I really don't know what this is going to do. This might actually destroy everything in the world, but it would be pretty cool if it worked. Um, config. OK, so it's telling me it has 11 new files. Here's my planet default teaser. So basically, it's finding my view, it's finding my node type, and it's finding a bunch of stuff about the entity and the field that's associated with it. So I'm going to import it. And fingers crossed. Ooh, that's funny. No, here's a fan. 
Yeah, it's thinking about. <laughs> My MacBook's about to go into orbit here. Yeah, okay. okay, so if I go under structure and I go under content types, I do have my planet, and if I manage fields, it has my galaxy field, and if I click on this, I see it's got my heretofore unknown galaxy and stuff like that. Hooray! All right. Um, so yeah, it all kind of works. It's pretty cool. Yeah? So since this is all GUI driven, it kind of requires the person doing the promotion to have pretty good knowledge of the content being promoted. Mm -hmm. How much of this is seamable or drop it in a Git and let them do a Git pull? Right. Yep. Uh, all of it is. So that thing I'm using to show you the UI, that's a module that you can turn off. So that's the configuration manager module. Mm -hmm. So you can flip that off and then uh, you can manage this through Git. And there are Git commands, or Drush commands. Oh, Drush help filter. config commands, uh, three. So I can config get, config import, config list, and config set. So let me try doing drush c set. Uh, here's the problem is we renamed a bunch of these and I don't remember, oh, but you know what, I can figure this out, config list. So let's set uh, system dot, uh, looking for slogan. Hmm. Oh, it's gonna be in system information or something like that. Oh. So this is the problem with live demos and people throwing things at you. Um, system dot, Oh, I think it's in here. Um, Trash C get system dot site. So then I think if I do drush, uh, I'm in production. I don't want to do this on production. That would be crazy. Although I can do it on production if I feel like it, I guess. Uh, yeah. And then you can all take turns whipping me in the face. That'll be a good time, yeah. Um, Josh C set system, system dot site. And then I want to set um, slogan to um, boo. Uh, yes, I would like to do that. Let's see if that actually worked. Mm -hmm. Oh! Look at that! Drush is amazing! I didn't do that this Yeah, okay. Yeah. So you can check all that into Git and then have an SA just for just basically do a pull on a prod? It's, yeah, basically it's a little trickier than that. So now it might make sense to come back over here so we can see this a little more clearly. Because both prod and dev are reading from the active store. And when you move things from one place to another, so here's me clicking export, Here's me uploading things. What it's going to do when you click upload is it's going to throw all of those files into the staging directory. And essentially how the import command works is it says, are there files in the staging directory? If there are, diff them against what's inactive and then show me the differences and then give them the chance to basically say yes or no. So yes, but it's just a little tricky because you have to just make sure that you're pulling to the right spot. It might be easier to set up like an rsync command than a like get command, but um, there was a guy at DrupalCon that had a tricky way of doing it. It was like he set in the settings.php files, he set the settings and active to the opposite or something like right. that, or had yeah, one. Most is more dropping into staging than it is actually putting them where they need to go. Exactly. Or yeah, okay. because there's a bunch of hooks that need to fire right. when that happens, like right. validation and stuff like that. So um, it's better to do it through. But there was a command. There was a drush command to do the import. It was config import, I think. Yeah. So everything I just did through the user interface, you can totally do in the command line. Right. Okay. Thank you. No problem. It's a great question. And I'm so glad to finally be able to say yes to some things because it was a long time that I couldn't. Um, so you can do diffs of stuff. You synchronize the changes. Then what happens is everything in staging gets moved to active. And now that's your new active on production. 
Make sense? Sort of? Yes? So can this for the user permissions and roles too? For the configuration module? Yeah, I don't know what we've got for that. That's a good question. Uh, permissions. That's one thing we did nice is we moved permissions and roles to the people page. Um, roles used to be buried in there somewhere. So the permissions are synchronized configuration, export configuration, and import configuration. I don't really know why you'd want to give someone import and export, but not synchronize, but you could, I guess. If you, well, if you wanted like one QA manager to be the only one who could re-image production, you could do it that way. Yeah. But if you make changes in the roles or permissions, those will export to the config object that you could Yeah, to. actually they will. So let me turn off when I turn off those permissions for everybody, save. Do that again. I know I can do it in Drush. I'm just way more used to this way, so I'm going to be a wuss. Sorry, guys. Uh, but yes, I believe it should do that, because users and roles and stuff are... Uh, not users, sorry, but role um, assignments and things like that. Those are all configuration. Do -do -do -do. Load. Mm -hmm. Oh, it got my slogan change, and then, uh, yep, so it, oh, it reordered everything. That's kind of unfortunate. Um, but the main thing is it got rid of those from the uh, file. Yeah? So if I'm writing a custom module which exposes my own uh, set of, you know, uh, permissions, so I'm a role, mm -hmm. and I want to Um, that's a good question. So you're asking like, is the, is the permission checking just at the UI level or is it at the API level? Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know that for sure. I have a feeling it's only at the UI level though, because at an API level, if you're directly calling functions, you really ought to know what you're doing. Um, I'd have to dig around the source code to tell you for sure though. But that's a good question. I think, though, that's right, because the permissions aren't in system module. They're in configuration management module, which means if I turned off configuration management module, those permissions would go away. So, yes? So I'm interested where you draw the line between content configuration. So, mm -hmm. is, um, so for example, menus, are they configuration? Menus, menus are configuration, and menu items are content, I believe is how it goes. Oh, I might be wrong about that. Menu links. So yeah, it's, it's really tricky. Um, the way it works on an API level is everything derives from an entity. And there are configuration entities and there are content entities. Um, and I don't know if you can flip those on a per site basis. At least, well, probably not. But anyway, it, it would interact with an entity. So potentially you could, if you decide on your site, menu items were also configuration, then you could pull those in and stuff like that. But that would be kind of out there. It's split down the middle. What's that? I'm sorry? It's split down the middle. It is split down the middle, yeah. Like if, if the object hierarchy is like entities here, config entities here, content entity is here, and then everything else comes below that. So like users, taxonomy terms, content or nodes, um, and other things are under content entities. And then things like views, blocks, um, uh, menus, vocabularies, yeah, things like that are under the configuration tree. Yeah. I'm not aware of a way to switch those assumptions, but everything is swappable, so I imagine it's possible. It'd just be kind of weird, because I don't know how the API would deal with that if it's expecting to call a particular function that's only in a config entity or something like that. So um, it's something we struggle with a lot, right? Because you can get really existential about it. You can be like, well, is there any difference between config and content and couldn't you? And somebody has a sandbox project that actually makes all the content entities config entities so that they all export. So you can actually export your content with your configuration as well, which is nice if you have a site that um, like doesn't have any user generated content over here that's gonna get blown away. Because um, you could just move your content over with your configuration file moving as you want to. So, um, but it's pretty experimental at this point. Core just kind of 
has made these distinctions. And it's a good time to start testing it, honestly, because if that's not the right call, we still have time to fix it. And right now, a lot of it has just been like, which bucket does it go in? How about that one? You know, because nobody's building actual sites with Drupal 8 yet. So, yeah. So what's the big difference in how you're treating content for configuration? I mean, if you, you, you just pushed both, right? You pushed the carrot page, which is content. I didn't push the carrot page, no. I thought you did. No, the carrot page oh, is only... Yeah, no, that's okay. No, carrot is only on production. Okay. Not on so dev. Push the configuration of the theme, which affected. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, right. That's confusing. The slogan is actually configuration, right. even though it's contenty. Yeah. So what do you do with? And this is kind of pushing what Drupal is probably set up to do, but essentially curated content. Where, oh. Where development of content is by user base, but promotion of content needs to be curated. Sure, so the question is, how does Drupal deal with curation of content? So like anybody can create something, but you need a process in order to see that through. Um, so Core doesn't do much with that at all, but there's a number of contributed modules that do, and the main one in Drupal 7 is the Workbench suite of modules, but there's also Workflow and a few other ones. And how they work is you can set up arbitrary workflow states, so say for example, pending legal review or needs media added or you know back for corrections or whatever it is and you can set up a number of roles and you can assign which roles have access to change things from one state to another um, so you can set it up so only like a super editor has the ability to move right. something from like draft to published for example okay. yeah core itself doesn't deal with that it just has everything live out of the box just because it's the easiest thing to do okay. All right. Oh yeah, and Drush integration for automation magic. Hooray! Um, other stuff, a lot more modern object-oriented code, a lot of directories, a lot of files. Um, in Drupal 8, every single class has to be in its own file, so you'll find things are kind of scattered all over the place. It's because we've started adopting other people's standards. So we have this movement in Drupal 8 called Proudly Found Elsewhere as opposed to not invented here. <laughs> so we're trying to change our tune a little bit. So we've been looking outside the Drupal community at what the larger PHP community is doing and the larger Ruby community and some of these other things. And so we've adopted some standards, some external libraries, um, things like that to try and be more harmonious with the rest of the PHP community. And, and so far that's been received really, really well. Although there will be quite a big jump if you cut your teeth in PHP on Drupal 7 and below it's going to be quite a big mental leap to go from seven to eight because uh, eight is like actual programming. It's not cute little copy and paste up function and rename it and you're done kind of thing. So. Um, lots of other stuff. If you want to know all of the things that we've done, you can go to drupal.org slash list hyphen changes and you'll find them all. It's kind of an overwhelming, scary list. So I recommend just searching for the thing that affects you and then, you know, going from there. Um, so I wanted to say, could we have a huge round of applause to the 1,100 contributors that have helped make Drupal 8 what it is? Yay! Um, all right, so you've been talking forever, it seems like. When can I use all of this rock and stuff? When it's done! <laughs> okay, okay, smartass. When is when it's done? Um, so if you go in your dashboard on Drupal.org, you can see this or contributor links block and it has a count of all of the major and critical bugs. So the count you want to keep your eyeballs on is the critical bug and critical task count. Right now those are at 44 and 86, which seems like a lot, but when we cut code freeze at Drupal 7, we had like 300 and something of those. So it's much better than it was in Drupal 7. Um, we need to have zero of those, and then we can cut a release candidate. And if we have a release candidate where we don't introduce any more criticals, then we release 8.0. And so the best thing that anyone who wants to do this stuff in real life can do is help get those counts down. Um, and a lot of them are, you really had to kind of be there and be involved in some of the discussions and this kind of thing. But there are a lot of them that are not like that at all. And actually a lot of these critical tasks are things like convert all of, say convert all of the variable calls to the new configuration management system or convert all of the hook menus to the new router system and things like that, where the individual tasks under there are actually pretty easy. 
And they're a great way to cut your teeth on Drupal 8 early so you don't get kind of hit with a truck later on when it's all done. Um, and then you can help make that number go down quicker. So we're hoping for Drupal 8.0 later this year, but there's still quite a lot to do. Um, and we kind of need all the help we can get. So when should I start using Drupal 8? And what I usually say, rather than trying to come up with a date, although if I had to guess, I'd say, well, anyway, we'll get to that. There's a, there's a page called Drupal.org Project Usage Drupal, and you can see the spark lines of um, data visualization. Hey, um, You can see the spark lines of what all of the different things are doing. And so this is the spark line for the, how Drupal 7 evolved. And so if we just switch the numbers and we pretend it's Drupal 8, this is what I would say. I would say if you're a module developer and you do stuff with code, I would get involved right now with one of those easy tasks or you know, something, port a module to Drupal 8 just for fun, for fun, you know. We all do that, right? Anyway, but I would say right now, because if you find glaring holes in the APIs or you find things that just aren't gonna work, there's still plenty of time to fix that because the APIs did get locked down recently, but it's still fine if it's a critical bug, we can still change things. That gets harder and harder as we get closer to release. If you're an early adopter, you're smarty pants, you're comfortable with being on the bleeding edge of things and things, I would say probably um, you'd want to wait until we start putting beta code out, which would be probably around DrupalCon Prague, maybe Bad Camp, a little later this year, September, October, something like that. Um, but if you're not comfortable with fixing other people's bugs, I would probably stay away. Um, what you might want to do is wait until the Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 lines cross. Uh, what that means is that more people are using Drupal 8 than are using Drupal 7, and that's actually a really great time to make a jump if you're sort of a late adopter and want to play it to, you know, close to the chest because um, that means that enough modules have been ported that people are actually starting to use Drupal 8 in real life and these kinds of things. Um, what you don't want to do is wait that late because if this is starting to go like this and you're building a Drupal you know, 7 site still when it's kind of in a downward spiral, you're gonna find yourself in a position where you're where the community's not at. And then a lot of the advantages you get of an open source content management system with a wonderful community around it are kind of lost on you. Like if you're making new sites in Drupal 6 now, you know, you're kind of in this position where it's like, nobody's really writing new modules for Drupal 6, people are all on Drupal 7 now, and some, some of them are even on Drupal 8 already, that kind of thing. You know, you don't want to find yourself in that position. So I would kind of keep tabs on this. That's usually your best indication is kind of see what the rest of the world's doing and sort of follow suit. And then where you end up on that line, it just matters of your comfort zone and what your launch date is and this kind of thing. So. Make sense? All right. Um, so Drupal does need you to get us to Drupal 8. So I just wanted to mention... These are a few things that people could help with, because I know you all are very smart and you're all developers. Um, performance improvements is a big thing. We, to some extent, this was expected because we didn't want to do premature optimization, but now that we're past all the API changes and stuff, we actually really need to like figure out where our problems are and get them identified and out of the way. Um, better RDFA support, I mentioned Lynn Clark's actually asking for help on that, and I know people here are into the semantic web stuff, so that would be a great place to help. Um, accessibility is another area. I think like five or six of the critical bugs are all around accessibility stuff. So if you know stuff about WCAG and um, you know keyboard accessibility, oral interfaces, things like that, we could definitely use your help. Upgrade path fixes are always needed. Um, as people test, they find bugs. Some of those are easy, some of them are a little less easy, um, but those are always needed. Um, finishing conversions of various APIs, again, that's a really great place to sort of cut your teeth if you want to kind of get involved in Drupal 8 and aren't sure where. And then finally, testing, testing, testing. And even if you are like in site builder land, you don't think of yourself as a developer, that's actually great because we've had nothing but developers looking at this thing for the past two years and we could really use some outside perspective. Because once again, it's like every time I go to do a demo, I find all kinds of bugs. So one cool thing about this live demo thing is like, at uh, like this time 12 hours ago, this didn't work at all. And I filed a bunch of issues and people patched them and I was committing patches while people were talking. So you guys actually helped fix like three major bugs in Drupal 8. So thanks for that. Um, so if you want to join us, drupal.org slash contribute. I'd also be happy to lead a boff if we want on like more, more uh, like accurately how to contribute and I can talk about IRC, how the issue queue works, that kind of thing, if that's of interest to anybody. Um, and then that's it. So thank you very much for having me and I uh, 
it was fun. I really enjoyed talking to you people, and yeah, you're great. <laughs> so, thanks. I think there's, there's coffee on it, so I want to suggest we take a comfort break. Sure. And then we can come back and continue the discussion as long as people want to hang out. Uh, or maybe we find places like a cushier chair or something. And, uh, uh, and then when things keep